Yo, 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 and welcome back to another episode of the Nick and Griff Show. Today is April 16th. It is 8.49 a.m. Central Standard Time here in beautiful Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's actually raining this morning. Got some good hail uh, this morning. That was fun. And some lightning and some thunder. So you can't complain. It, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a gloomy morning here, but uh, I don't mind it at all. Griff, how was your week this past week? We've talked we talked a couple of times during the week, but uh, how's your weekend up shaping out? It was good. Weekend comedian Easter. I got steaks. Inflation hurts, but mm-hmm. I still persevered. Got a couple of ribeyes, you know what I'm saying? So it'll be a good weekend. Good deal. Man, let's uh let's hop into the wonderful market check here. We uh we had a couple of things happen uh this week with Mr. Elon here, who we can see on the front page. Obviously, we had that stuff going on with Twitter, and that's still uh playing out right now. Uh how, how wild is it that he was so he bought he bought 9.2% of Twitter like a month ago, whatever it was. And then a couple of weeks in, everybody noticed and uh, the price shot up. He made like 20 million bucks and uh, they were like, come be a part of the board. They accepted him in and everything. And then he pulls out. He's like, nope, I'm selling all this. I'm not going to be a part of the board. Goes quiet for like five days and then submits his order. I say order his uh, his request or uh, I don't know how, whatever you want to call it to buy 100% of Twitter for forty three billion dollars. I mean, that's that's pretty uh, that's pretty wild. It's a lot of money, man. Yeah, I mean, it's Elon. Dude's going. I mean, he's doing what he's going to do. I, I mean, I, I don't. I support it. I wish it could just be owned by everybody somehow. Whatever. That Twitter. sounds uh, that sounds interesting. Sounds like you're getting some Web three type stuff or something. I don't know. I mean, I think the concept of it is kind of cool, but. I think it'd be better if he owned it than, you know, who currently has most of the shares of Twitter. Ooh, look at crude oil. I haven't seen this here this week. I haven't really followed around here. No, we dropped way off. Oh, it's climbing again. And uh, so for you guys that are just listening here, the S&P went up middle of the week, came back down, still up a little bit, sitting at 43000 and uh, Bitcoin um this week oh was i looking at the at the month i was sorry the s p went down this week um and bitcoin is sitting at forty thousand four hundred, and uh went up a little bit middle of the week came back down and is kind of kind of trading sideways right now so um you know the main thing to keep in mind when we think about the market check right is what is it griff one bitcoin's one bitcoin right we're just going to keep saying it so people start uh, r- repeating it and believing it, not when just the price goes up, when it goes down, when it goes up. It's always just going to be one Bitcoin. One Bitcoin's one Bitcoin. Hey, well, okay. Uh, we we got to hop in here because I, I'm excited about uh, a guest that we've got on today. A guy by the name of Charlie Spears. He is uh, one of the co, I don't know if it's two or if it's three co founders. Uh, but one of a few co-founders of a company called Nakamoto here, based here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, they've got uh, they've got a really interesting uh, niche that they're working with, um, and, I, and I'm excited to let him tell you a little bit more about what that niche is. This guy is uh, also uh, the main guy that runs all the Tulsa meetups here uh, for the Bitcoin Tulsa meetups, um, and uh, is a super cool guy. I think he's got a really fun perspective. I've, I've met him and talked with him one time. I think we had, uh, I was on a Twitter space and, uh, and it was OKC or it was Bitcoin day OKC. And I was like, huh, I wonder if that's Oklahoma city clicked on it. It was. And Charlie was one of the guys that was talking on that. And, um, I said, uh, he, he said something about, Oh, I'm here in Tulsa. We'll be out there. And I was like, Oh, it's a Tulsa guy. I've never met another Bitcoiner in real life here in Tulsa. I got to shoot a message to this guy. I got to get connected with this guy. And so shot him a DM and I think just maybe a week or, or a couple of weeks later, we went and grabbed coffee at a coffee shop uh, in downtown Tulsa. And we sat down and talked for like two hours and it was a lot of fun. He's got a great uh, perspective uh, and I'm happy to have him here. Charlie, welcome on to the Nick and Griff show. We are juiced to have you. The Bitcoin accelerationist. Hey guys, I'm super glad to be here. Uh, 
yeah, Nick, there's there's more than just one of us or two of us in Tulsa who like Bitcoin. There's uh, there's dozens of us and uh, beautiful monthly. And it's kind of funny because, you know, like I, I a similar similar to you, like I, I let the whole Bitcoin thing incubate for years kind of alone. And I realized, oh, uh, there's other people like us. I just we have to all get together. And that's why we do the meetups. You know, what I've seen is is because of, because of all the energy production here in this part of the country, and Tulsa specifically, um, what I've heard, I don't know if this is true or not, maybe it's just rumors, but that, that Tulsa is starting to become a, a Bitcoin hotbed. Is that true? Or what are your thoughts on that? I would love that. I think the incentives are there. The, uh, the, the direction is there. Um, think it's going to be a couple of years, but I think it'll happen faster than anybody realizes. So I'm very optimistic. I'm doing my part to try to make that happen and make that happen in a healthy way. You know, you know how this goes. Like there's it, Robert Frost's two fat, two paths to virgin wood. And I think we can uh, take a, a couple directions and I'm trying to get people to, uh, you know, at least define a healthy conversation from the outset so that when mm. the important decisions, the important things happen, then we can at least have a good foundation community and education about how to, how to go forwards. That's good. I like, I like that you said define the conversation, right? I think, I think there's so many people like I, I loved whenever I really, whenever I first started getting into Bitcoin, I was like trying to figure out what was what I went on and I watched, uh, there's so many good debates on YouTube with like the, what is it, like the Soho Soho Forum or what is that that's in New York? Or, anyways, there's there's a lot of those good debates. And uh, dude, there were so many times where like I haven't watched one of those debates where somebody that was against Bitcoin presented a good argument because it was like this guy's arguing this thing, this guy's arguing this thing, and they're using different terminology and nothing makes sense. I mean, I, that's so I like that defining the conversation. You also mentioned something uh, that I'd like to I don't know if you know about uh, or not. You, you mentioned incentives. Um, so it was it was Martinez and Montgomery here in Oklahoma submit legislature for tax incentives for mining. I'm sure you've seen that. I have. I actually surprisingly don't know a whole lot about that. I don't know specifically who they're talking to. I think it's some of the guys in OKC who are helping bootstrap that. I mean, there's been previous efforts. Um, you'll, I'm going to introduce you to Matthew Moore here in town. He's got a, sh a radio show on KRMG. He's been, you know, 2019 banging his head against the wall in Oklahoma City. That was a bear market. Uh, <laughs> trying to get this kind of pro-Bitcoin, at least pro-digital asset, uh, you know, legislation uh, through in, in our state capital. And it was just uh, fruitless. But I think, you know, there's another round, uh, another effort push coming through. And yeah. look, there's there's oodles of money coming into Oklahoma. People don't realize it yet. If you look, the the amount of Bitcoin miners, like large scale public or not, or private companies are coming and building stuff, infrastructure in Oklahoma is staggering. And I think a lot of the legacy money, I come from oil and gas, and um, a lot of us don't realize how quickly the investment is going to flood into our state. And so this is just the first harbinger of that, of what I think is going to be a lot of incentive um, to, to be pro Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, people talk about Texas, this Texas, that two years ago, the legislators in Texas had no idea what Bitcoin was. Um, Ted Cruz, who I saw in person a couple weeks ago, who demonstrated a, a surprisingly sophisticated, coherent understanding of Bitcoin and what makes it tick um, from a legislative perspective. Two years ago, I don't think you knew anything about it. I think we sit where Texas was about a year and a half ago. And I think um, it's going to happen very quickly. And the um, agile, forward-thinking uh, legislators are going to really embrace this. Um, I think Oklahoma, Texas uh, have a very bright future ahead of us. I can't say that for uh, other uh, anti or Bitcoin critical regimes uh, in the country, though. <laughs> Where are the, what does California sit at with that? Because <clears throat> I got to be honest, out here in Sacramento, I've tried the whole Nick route of finding more Bitcoiners or whatever you want, however you want to say it. There's not a lot. I wear my Bitcoin sweatshirt around, you know, everybody kind of just looks at me like, what's wrong with that guy? And I'm like, all right, yeah. 
Yeah. It's all good. Like no big deal. But I'm slowly orange pilling. Uh, at least like I work in the medical industry. So when, you know, I like to say one doctor at a time, once I actually get to know him. And honestly, I have to be honest, like they're very interested. Like they'll, they'll ask me about it. Cause a lot of these doctors I work with are in their sixties or maybe even like seventies. <clears throat> so they were around for the dot com boom and bust. And some of them are very wealthy because they have a lot of money and they bought a lot of tech stocks and they piled right through the boom and the bus. But with Bitcoin, they're like pretty interested because they deal with insurance companies. They don't like the system. They're beaten down as well. Like if you're not in the industry, you don't understand doctors. Like they kind of don't get treated as well as you think in America, which does, I don't know, in my opinion, cause a lot of problems. But uh, why is Tulsa so good for mining? Is it because you guys have a lot of non-renewables? It's, it's I mean, energy it's and it's a favorable energy. energy and a favorable business climate. And it's it's you know i say tulsa just because it's one of the two metropolitan areas in the in oklahoma really <laughs> real metropolitan areas um the mining is going to be built outside in more rural um the uh more, more rural areas you've got half a gigawatt going in muskogee 100 200 megawatts going in prior uh a couple other yet to be announced major companies i i'm certain are building and looking and you know, Griff, you talk about you live in Sacramento, right? California. Yeah. Um, you know, five, ten years ago, Bitcoin crypto was this like tech thing, right? People were like, oh, it's it's like another Silicon Valley thing. But what we what we've seen is that it's not limited geographic to, geographically to Silicon Valley. In fact, in many ways, the kind of legacy tech uh structure and regime that is that was built and defined in california almost is at a disadvantage yeah they're technologically mm. proficient but you really need to be um um uh very forward thinking and tech as yeah. it is is not very agile and forward thinking and so yeah. that's why you have kind of what i call like the global uh uh revolution where silicon valley is anywhere it's in India, it's in Africa, it's if you have a cell phone, it's in the middle of rural Oklahoma, that's where the cool shit on Bitcoin is being built. Mm. That makes a lot of sense to me. That is so cool. Well, yeah. in, is it as easy for a state government to just, I don't know, not tax miners to get them to come out to your state? Like, why doesn't every, why haven't like some of these game theory things started to play out even more? Or are they just about to? You know what I'm saying? I mean, I don't know. Nick, what do you th So uh, touching on that, uh, the legislature that Oklahoma is pushing right now, and to Charlie's point, who, whoever exactly the people are that are pushing that. Anyways, uh, went through and read the deal. Charlie, I'll send it to you. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of, it's pretty basic to read. But uh, the major pieces is, is that I guess right now, and Charlie can probably get on this too. Um, I guess right now, if you've got a business, let's call it knock a motor. I don't know. I guess that would maybe work. Yeah. And you buy depreciable assets, right? Um, let's call them miners. Let's call them uh, generators. All, fill in the blank. I don't know. You know, you you would be able to the two know big, all those yeah, things. two big expenses for us. Yeah. Right. Those, those, all of those things, um, I guess, are not depreciable right now, or are they? I don't, I don't know. But it, it mentioned a lot in the in the the legislature that they had written that uh, those were going to be depreciable assets. You were going to be able to write those things off. All, and it, it mentioned all those different th different elements. W what are your thoughts on that? Charlie? Well, you'll, as always, you'll have to talk to my accountant. I'm the vision strategy pitch guy for the company. My other two partners are heads down engineers. And then uh, I realized I shouldn't be, uh, I, I signed the checks, but we hand all the important stuff to, to the accountant. But yeah. um, I mean, the thing is like, uh, we can currently depreciate our ASICs, the Bitcoin miners, as computers or computer infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is like all this is very uncertain and not defined because it's more like um, more of an industrial commodity production infrastructure, kind of like, you know, an excavator at a coal mine. Like that's more what an ASIC is analogous to than a computer. Mm. And so it's the uncertainty with regards to how this stuff is taxed and understood where clarity is in, is welcomed. So to specify, oh, these are the kind of core infrastructure and core things that Bitcoin miners use and do and procure to, to clarify how those can be treated um, 
is incredibly useful. I mean, my deal is like, um, it's not like certain states have higher, you know, production taxes for Bitcoin miners, and they do. It's more just like, we just need a regulatory certainty and, and to know that you're not going to ban us like New York State yeah. has tried to do. and Because then we can go in and build these, you know, three, five, eight year business plans. Mm -hmm. And it, it's really just more about mm -hmm. knowing that the bank's not going to shut you down, that yeah. people can invest in you without worrying about, you know, fundamental shifts in how that's treated. Like, that's really what it is. I mean, I had to, I've had to, uh, I will say the Oklahoma Tax Commission has actually been pretty great. Everybody else I've talked to has been like pulling teeth for every single little thing. But, hmm. um, you know, at least they're like, yeah, sure, just pay your taxes. We don't really understand it, but, you know, uh, great. And um, that's all I want. And I think that's what most people want is just to be like, here's you, we we're not going to be punitive towards you. We'll at least try to um, give you regulatory clarity. Hmm. Now, I have a good question. You say, okay, so visionary of the company for a Bitcoin company, one sounds like my dream job, but two, yeah. oh man, yeah. Um, but two, yeah. you saying visionary and saying reg regulation is really what you need to foresee like the next six to eight years. But as like a Bitcoin visionary of the company, I just love to hear what you like. What do you mean? Where do you see this thing in eight years? Like, what are you guys going to be trying to do? How far can Bitcoin go? I think Nick has already mentioned because. I'd like to just start to get to this part, tier one civilization, tier two. Like I would like to know about these things uh, and visionary. I don't know if we could have a better person explain them. So I yeah, want to like hop into some of that. But so I, like I mean, I've been I've been in Bitcoin a decade. I don't, you know, talk about specifically where I have fallen over the years, um, but I've I've seen multiple bear markets. Uh, stuck with it. I have my battle scars. And I have, I think, kind of like, you know, that old wizened gray beard and, and a bit of that thousand yard stare in my eye because I <laughs> I've seen the shit go everywhere, man. And it's not it's not been easy. Um, and we and kind of post 2017, the the, the 2018, 2019 Bitcoin entrance crowd uh, has been uh, wonderful because they're laser eye focused, laser focused on specifically Bitcoin. Um mm. And uh, that's a blessing and a curse. I think it creates some myopia, but it also uh, creates some strength. Kind of like I, I analogize, I analogize um, the the this Bitcoin class of 2018, 2019, kind of like white blood cells. They'll fight for purity of the mm. but can can often um, can often destroy uh, it their own. But ultimately, they're a necessary part of the the full corpus. So what I'm getting at is. I have for a long time never imagined that I could turn my interest in Bitcoin into an actual job. I uh, my family has been in oil and gas for 50, 60 years now. And about 2017, as the post the block size wars, which is a whole other conversation. Yeah, they're like white blood cells. I think that analogy will work very well going forward as you try to figure out how you understand the the modern Bitcoin narrative. So um Families in oil and gas and uh, saw that uh, post block size wars, I got really into the uh, idea of understanding mining and the energy part of it. And so that's where I was like, oh, there is abundant energy in our backyard here in Oklahoma. I'm in oil and gas. This is a match made in heaven. I have to become an expert on mining. Um, I have to figure out other people who uh, can fill in the gaps of the places I don't understand with regards to actually building a commercial scale Bitcoin mine. And so Nakamoto puts mines on gas wells, among other things. But there's abundant cheap energy. Going forwards, um, I like to talk about um, as, as mining allows us to leverage energy and really innovate across the entire energy stack, what does that look like over the years, over the decades? And so how does that transform society? And that's what... I just get so excited about, as I said, I've been in the space a long time. I've heard pretty much every narrative and I love them. I love what you guys are doing, store value, hard money, all this stuff. That's a strong narrative. I've just been in the space for so many years and I've heard it. And I just look for uh, 
kind of new ways to skin this cat and stuff that I've never heard of before. That's why I talk about me as a Bitcoin accelerationist or futurist because I I'm a huge fan of science fiction. I love kind of the novelty of talking about like far off in the years. Yeah. And this is where we get into uh, very esoteric stuff, very kind of weird fringe things, which are not not Bitcoin canon, but uh, uh, Bitcoin speculation, more like Bitcoin fiction, science fiction, if you will. And that's what go. I that's what I that's one of my favorite talking points. That's what I like to do. Charlie, uh, would you please tell us a little bit more about Nakamoto? When did you guys start? Uh, you've got what you've got two other co-partners yeah co i got two other yeah then they're really not even online they are heads down guys in fact they're wonderfully blissfully insulated from the other kind of the broader narrative neither of them are on twitter they're barely on any other social media um, but they're both oil and gas guys i've known them my whole life we've worked off and on over the years and um we have independently been doing independently been doing the whole Bitcoin mining thing for a collective decade. But um, one of my partners uh, run uh, uh, built one of the larger GPU mining, so altcoin mining operations. Hmm. Um, and uh, uh, he, but he he runs um, remote drilling operations for Helmrick and Payne. You know, one of the bigger drilling contractors in the country. And um, so he transition to full uh bitcoin about two or three years ago and we were able to kind of leverage that into um this bitcoin focused mining uh venture i mean I, I i think you know i'm i'm a bit mercenary about how to mine i think you can make money however i just think if you're going to build a 10-year business plan you can only really talk about bitcoin and um so mm -hmm. nakamoto stands for satoshi nakamoto's motor and this is a novel term that i uh heard concepted by this guy named austin storms um <coughs> from a paper he has yet to publish and he calls it satoshi nakamoto's motor which is the entire incentive mechanism of bitcoin mining to turn and leverage energy into compute into security and mm -hmm. satoshi nakamoto's motor which is the the whole Bitcoin mining stack will revolutionize energy um, around the world. Um, mm -hmm. Previously, if you produced or consumed energy, you were kind of limited to a certain time and space in which you could do that. If you produced you know, a watt here, you had to consume it here kind of at the same time. Now, you can produce energy anywhere in the world, agnostic to geography, and have it be profitable. This is like the invention of fire or industrial or, or agriculture or the mm. internal combustion engine with how revolutionary it is to human society. Um, previously, you know, we had to hunt and gather and we could, we could, we had to forage for our food and with agriculture, we could um, become more sophisticated in, in social organization. We could produce crops, build permanent settlements. This allows us to create, higher orders of governance structure i'm rolling you know going back through human history and in with the internal combustion engine we can then produce industry and factories which that allow us to produce massive amounts of goods and services and net increase the standard of human living with satoshi nakamoto's motor we are able to now leverage energy anywhere around the world <coughs> You look at Russia and Ukraine, which is, among other things, a conversation about energy and how energy is used. Imagine this extrapolated all across the world. And Africa is not uh, is not energy poor. They are energy rich. Why is that energy not able to be leveraged uh, at scale to build and lift up those peoples? I think it will be. And countries and parts of the world which embrace this will uh, experience undue civilizational advance over the next century. Nick, I feel like I'm just saying, I, I don't feel like I was as well articulated as that, but like, that's kind of what I've been, my thesis <laughs> on Bitcoin really is as well. Like how I've seen it, <clears throat> and I haven't been in it as long as you, and that was like 
that was awesome stuff. Um, Bitcoin, the internet is a country competing with NATO and, you know, the Eastern civilizations, just like Bitcoin is now an economy that is competing with, well, everything else. And like you're saying, now all of these small countries, pretty much if they can just get an internet connection and, you know, mine some energy, they can really start bolstering their economies. And that's good for everybody, obviously, because wealth inequality is a thing in the world. It would be nice if we could, you know, in a sense, <clears throat> I don't know what everybody's goal of civilization is here, but it'd be nice if we could, like, everybody would want to be engineers or scientists so that we could, you know, mine this Bitcoin, kind of like get more out of every civilization. Because who knows where the next Albert Einstein comes from? It could be in Africa, it could be wherever. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if that's where you're going with it, but I just think it's like Bitcoin gives the world the ability to. I don't know, scale talent, like you can get talent from anywhere because really talent comes from economies like the United States where you can, if you are talented, you know, there's enough money here to actually do something with that talent as opposed to other countries, right? Like, Oh the- yeah. Yeah. Griff, you're, you're right on the money. Like, <clears throat> um, I, you know, I love the United States embrace of the free market. That's good. But it's that's the reason we're successful is not because we're smarter than other people necessarily. We just have the tools and um, availability for people with skills to leverage those. <clears throat> the main one of the main barriers to the abundance of talent all over the world is just that people don't live in regimes where they have access to a place to store that mental and talent energy. You, you know, you talk about monetary energy and the the best form of monetary energy we've discovered as humanity is is in bitcoin so um if you are banging your head against the wall as some brilliant person in india um you have significantly more barriers to being able to scale that and build things um than someone in the united states now i don't think that's going to be the case going forwards and that's why i'm very bullish and excited for um the future of uh uh, less developed countries. Now, India is considerably developed, but um, like, you know, I, I really, I, I don't want to diminish efforts uh, internationally to uh, from U.S. citizens and the Western countries to try to help uh, underprivileged people. But like, you can only like do so many micro investment farms to help some dude in Africa build a chicken farm if someone's just going to come seize that and he has no money to spend. And he can't even get dollars if he tried. Um, So, but now you don't even have to do it. If you have a cell phone, a cell phone at all, um, and an internet connection, and Elon Musk is putting the satellites everywhere so you can get that. Yeah, that's also pretty helpful too. That like accelerates the dream, doesn't it? Oh yeah. Internet, you know, by the end of the decade, everyone will have internet and high speed internet, kind of be able to do whatever they want. And that means that we in the United States need to figure out ways to actually be valuable rather than extractive. And uh, so I I just I I get very excited for the new ideas of people who aren't constrained by I I don't want to diminish, you know, Western ideals. But, you know, we have a certain way of thinking and it's not the ultimate way of thinking. And I think that there's all sorts of cool things Mm -hmm. that can be built um, from people who just think very different than us. And that's just why I get and it allows me to be kind of apolitical about it because I I can be both endorsing and critical of of our of how we do things here in the, uh, you know, in the West. And um, I think that throws people for a loop because I I get to play both sides of the aisle here and get to be like, well, I I'm, I, I, I love I'm I'm pro human rights, but I'm also pro liberty. And like those are it, it, when you change the conversation like that, it throws people because they can't categorize you. And that's mm. one of the cool things about Bitcoin is that it, it falls outside of the what I feel is the arbitrary political dichotomy of mm. conversation. That's we good. can we can be both and and take the best parts of of all of these other ideas and form them into something new. And that is this, as you said, Griff, the the new internet state or internet network, uh, which is founded upon Bitcoin, but really just a. a uh, a new type of governance and human organization structure. That is, really uh, that is that's some really good stuff there. Yeah, yeah. So it just elevates the original concepts of what America 
was put here to do anyway, right? Like the Western ideologies. Now, obviously, we're seeing like freedom can be taken a lot of ways, you know, like obviously, you know, like I, I put it out there. A huge thing right now is uh, what pronouns and like all of those types of things. So like a free society doesn't always mean that things are going to go the way that you think. But I would argue America is not really like as free as it once was. And hopefully Bitcoin can kind of bring us back there because our competitive advantage, our government doesn't understand the competitive advantage of America was a free market. Free market always wins. Yeah. I mean, it just it just does like it might be slow at one point. But once you start like stacking good ideas on top of good ideas and good investment on good investment plays a, like a big role. So what do you think about like the housing market and, you know, how elevated it is? And I guess yeah. like what do you think about have you ever checked out the website? What the fuck happened in 1971? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, what do you think about like all that? that that's Bitcoin canon. You have yeah. you have the white paper behind me, um, and then uh, you've got the white paper, and then you've got the you could almost call it like the apostolic texts of Bitcoin. And WTF happened in 1971 is one of those. Uh, it's like uh, it's like the the C.S. Lewis to uh, you know the Bitcoin uh, scripture almost. So um, it's to be read. It is to be read in addition to uh, the original uh, writings of Satoshi. And I, I actually make this analogy a lot because you talk about <clears throat> the United States and free or whatever. It's So I, I, I think of the white paper kind of like a new type of constitution in the way that the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, uh, defined a certain set of values and implemented it in uh, a historic way. Um, I think so the white paper also does that for the uh, three to five centuries going forwards. Mm. Wow. Uh, Charlie, I got to ask you a question here because you guys are, you two, the two of you guys, because Griff is like the guy that he, he, he'll just take something and just run. And then, <laughs> and then, and then I pull him back to the, to the road. And then we talk about a little this, a little that, and then I let him run again. Yeah. And then I bring him back. So I got to ask you, I, I want, I got two questions. So I want to pull you guys back and then I want to set you off again. Okay. Um, so the, the first one here is moving forward, right? We, we actually haven't really done a breakdown of this on the show yet, but the halving cycles, that's huge. It's, it's got what? 32 built in halvings, correct? Is it 32? About, I, I don't expect to live to see all of them. <laughs> oh yeah. No, no, for sure. Right. So but speculating and looking forward into the future as that as that Bitcoin subsidy decreases over time via the halving cycle, what what does that how, how could I'm not going to say how will it, but how could that change the the industry of mining moving forward into the future? God, I I could try to be concise. Um, this is a bit of a philosophical question at this point. Um, right now, because Bitcoin miners are awarded. Uh, Bitcoin for each block they find, and the but that Bitcoin has primarily been newly created Bitcoin um, from the network. Right now, six point two five Bitcoin each ten minutes, and you have your that's called the block reward, or sorry, the um, the 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 base reward, and you've got on top of that all the fees that happened on the network on top of that. And right now, you know. A miner's reward is like 6.25 Bitcoin and then maybe like 0.1 or 0.8 Bitcoin on top of that. But as the as as the amount of Bitcoin being issued decreases every four years, 2024, it'll be 3.125. 2028, it'll be 1.7 something. And but by, you know, by in like eight to 12 short years, you'll have less than a Bitcoin being issued every 10 minutes. And um, if this is a industry which now at today you know is about 20 billion dollars a year in revenue <clears throat> and has an, uh, has a tendency to grow orders of magnitude every 5 years 4 years we're looking at a an industry that expects to generate a trillion dollars in gross revenue by the end of the decade annually and if a bitcoin one bitcoin is being issued every 10 minutes now you're looking at an issuance of in 2020 2032 or something of like a hundred Bitcoin a day, that means a Bitcoin has to be worth like five million dollars. 
Um, yeah. Unless uh, the the miner's reward is uh, actually not only from that Coinbase transaction, that, that base uh, new issuance. So there's not a lot of discussion on this. And this is really only something that even public companies can kind of hand wave and be like, uh, well, you know, we expect the, the fees per block to increase. I had to model this to our investors over the past two to three months in a way that's coherent and defensible. And there's not a lot of research on this. So I, I would say this, I'd make this statement. By the end of the decade, the uh, fees per block should, on average, be higher than the base block reward. That is, if we're issuing one Bitcoin per block by the end of the decade, the miners reward should be over one Bitcoin per block. Maybe it's two, maybe it's five. I, I don't know. Um, but this has really big implications because it it really warps how you kind of understand the model. And um, uh, you can create this, you can interpret this so many ways, even just on a decade timeline. Hmm. But miners are, they, 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 they transition in and the, how they are kind of, uh, how they secure the network. Um, a lot of people try to make this low-hanging fruit analogy. Of miners are kind of like Visa. They kind of help, you know, transmit. And that's a little bit like that. But I would say like Strike or Layer 2 situate. Or, you know, Lightning is going to be more of like a your kind of fast settlement network. Bitcoin miners are kind of like... Um, uh, Defense contractors. Yeah, it's, like, yeah, well, almost. I don't want to make that. I don't you like that watch analogy. Jason Lowry stuff at all. Have you ever seen him talk about? Yeah, it, they're how more have like a hash force or whatever. Like, yeah, that it's. I, we don't even have the language to think to talk about it yet, but it's yeah. kind of like we're like the defenders mm. of the network, but non-violently. More like uh, we just. Uh, kind of like the earth has a gravitational force which is to its nature of being a physical thing in space miners will almost kind of like radiate this gravity or force which draws everything and forces it to behave under the under the laws in our kind of region of space and that's so bitcoin mining actually takes more of like um it blurs with the idea of energy itself I mean, even in maybe 20 years or so, <clears throat> mining is maybe less of a discrete or distinct industry and more of just um, like a fundamental integration to human society. Like we don't, you know, we, you know, there are farmers and they, you know, in, in our world today and they um, and they have these crops and everything. But we don't distinguish between um, a farmer and uh, someone who is an agriculturist who helps define how farming shall be done. I mean, arguably it, it's just, these are, this is, we understand that this is how we do things these days in the same way. I think Bitcoin mining may be like just, uh, Oh yeah, that's, that is a, uh, you know, non-distinguishable from energy production. Mm. And I, I think that's, that's where we'll be in 20, 30 years. And obviously this is why you would say proof of work is pretty invaluable to, I don't know the whole conversation because isn't the whole thing about, I mean, pretty much Ethereum is trying to move to proof of stake or whatever. I mean, you've obviously, you've been in it for a long time. Do you even pay attention to like anything else? I mean, like, cause you've obviously studied everything. Do any of these altcoins interest you at all? Like I hate even bringing it up. I just have to ask because. Yeah. I, I love to know. talk about it. I'm well, not, I don't personally, because I kind of just think lightning really takes care of a lot of that. Obviously it's not as, as our friend Nico, who's like an altcoin enthusiast likes to point out, I guess lightning's not as fun to build on necessarily. Um, it's not as easy to build on. I, you know, but sometimes I try to remind them like, that's not always what matters when it comes to like building in a space, but What's your take? Like, do you think there's a place for other things? Do you think Bitcoin is fully scalable? Because I, I do see a little bit of a problem being everything being divided by 21 million to a degree in finance, because our world is 
I mean, we are so down this rabbit hole of credit and debt <laughs> and like, I mean, like how would everything be measured? There would be a, there'd be a pretty big, I mean, recession in a sense, be a, like fully going to a 21 million Bitcoin standard globally, obviously. Like, so how do you see us kind of getting to that point? Because that would be great. Everything divided by 21 million also means it's cheaper which means more people can buy, like money has more purchasing power, you know, shouldn't it have more purchasing power over time? But how do you see us getting there? I mean, gosh, there's like, gosh, there's like 18 different topics I could divide this into. Oof. I actually think um, <clears throat> one of the best criticisms of Bitcoin is the fact that it is supply limited. Um, we have seen in human mm. history, effectively a monetary base gold be kind of, uh, you know, static and that was okay i think i'm not a monetary history expert so i actually think that's one of the best criticisms of bitcoin because it is kind of uh it is a good debate to have so i actually appreciate right. i think people who criticize its uh you know deflationary nature uh, that is a good faith good criticism and conversation we can have i i uh my response to that is actually kind of weird, but um, okay. it, it actually comes down to if you take a very, if you zoom very far out of humanity and you look at the population of humanity over the past 10,000 years, you have humanity growing like this. And then about two or 300 years ago, post industrialization, you see massive spike in uh, population growth. Mm -hmm. And I think in the grand scheme of human history, we'll view this as a very very short blip in in humanity's transition where we have a massive population spike and then about 2050 or so it's going to level out or at least we anticipate it leveling out and i think during this brief 300 year period in human history is where we as humanity throw a lot of shit at the wall and out at, from that comes this idea of fiat money um which has to be inflationary because the whole human race is inflationary and post uh uh, post kind of leveling off of the human population explosion, um, that is when a we can return to a more hard money standard. And that is not an answer that I've really heard other people give because it takes a very, very macro approach to society mm. and sociology. And I wonder, and that's why I wonder if Satoshi um, was was not just a cryptographer or monetary theorist, but perhaps were they like a sociologist or an anthropologist, like mm. when you get into like the implications on a century to multi-century level of Bitcoin, you have to now understand that you're dealing with like giant generational things, it, uh, of, uh, generational movements and trajectories. And, you know, uh, and that's why I think social, uh, you know, Satoshi was, they were an expert on philosophy uh, religion, economics, energy, they everything. And and that's why I'm so amazed because the deeper down this rabbit hole you go, the more wild and um, mystical it becomes about the mm. implications of, of, of Bitcoin on, on the human race. This is why I talk about a Bitcoin acceleration is because I want to, I don't necessarily think the transition to this post Bitcoin or you might say hyper Bitcoinized world is going to be easy and i just want to accelerate there i think there are certain problems with the way things exist and i would prefer that we get to this this bitcoin world sooner rather than later um and uh yeah so i i actually didn't even talk about altcoins yet but um i'll let that we don't need to talk about them it's okay we let, don't let we me don't talk about them on the podcast anyway but altcoins are uh, as i describe them the biggest waste of bitcoin's time like it just doesn't make any sense to even really compare the two it's like comparing apples like to oranges it doesn't make much sense to me uh yeah obviously people have their ideas and obviously like people make money and i do think kind of like and to the point that you're saying money is so diluted now there are so many scams out there there are so many things that you know like people are People are making a lot of money doing a lot of stupid stuff right now and like that's just kind of like the nature of our society and like that's not good to a degree right like i mean you really want things to be done productively just 
if we're I'd like, like I always say, like we're trying to get somewhere, right? Like, and I think that somewhere is freedom for everybody and you kind of have to unlock the money, right? So having sound money, like, does that really factor into how you think about the future? Just like when you make money, when you can get it to your base, you know, your base layer, your Bitcoin wallet, what have you. Hey, and then I've, I've got to add on crazy. to the end of to the end of that question. So hit on that piece, and then I've got to I've got to push you guys in the direction of is it Nikolai Kardashev? Yeah, Nikolai I've got Kardashev. To push you into, to oh, what yeah. is what is the Type One civilization? Yeah, and we'll, how does that play into? We'll get there. Yeah, what you were talking about with the leveling <laughs> off of you know thinking way further out into the future. Yeah. Um. So I. You know, I like to say this about about uh, things that are not Bitcoin. Um, I find them fascinating, really exciting, and um, but I'm agnostic about them. I'm not. Uh, a lot of people would say they're they they're morally opposed or ethically opposed to things that are not Bitcoin, and I think that's a noble stance. I, I don't have that. Um, I like to say the same open mind and curiosity that led me to Bitcoin many years ago. I try to hold and find that novelty and excitement um, to keep my mind open. So I, I, I dabble, I, I engage the entire space. Personally, I like to only message about Bitcoin. Like I'll go down the rabbit hole and weeds and talk about, you know, degenerate DeFi farming schemes with um, kind of a more inner circle type thing, because that's just fun. Um, but, uh, you know, personally, I, I, whenever I'm gonna talk about it, I'm gonna be like, well, I, this is cool. I'm a focus on Bitcoin. I think it works very well from a messaging standpoint. And also, like, I look back at all the other times I've talked about stuff that's not Bitcoin over the years, and it just doesn't hold up very well. Um, so take it from some, you know, personal wisdom and experience that um, I don't want to write everything else off. I just, uh, over the years, only feel comfortable um, promoting and talking about why I like Bitcoin so much. Um so uh, yeah, going forwards, what is this idea of uh, of type one, type two civilizations? This is this gets very esoteric, um, but this is uh, this is where we get like science fictiony. And I gave a, a talk at Bitcoin Day, Oklahoma City, called "Bitcoin is literally science fiction," and this is where like it gets very cool. And again, everything I say is not Bitcoin canon. I'm going to be try to try to be very reductionist and kind of hand wavy about a lot of it. But this is like where some of the cool, weird ideas come from. So can Bitcoin work on Mars? Um, <clears throat> yeah, you can you could go to Mars with, you know, a Bitcoin wallet and send, you know, a radio transmission broadcasting uh, Bitcoin transaction back to Earth, the Bitcoin network, right? So yeah, we, we could use and hold and, and interact with Bitcoin on Mars, but very importantly, the speed of light, assuming we're still limited by the speed of light in 100 years, is the, the communication time between Earth and Mars is going to be over 10 minutes and sometimes 40 minutes. Mm. So, um, uh, which doesn't mean you can't use Bitcoin. It, it just means rather that if you are mining Bitcoin, and you're submitting hashes, trying to find mm. uh, find the next block. You are um, not only at a significant disadvantage, but occasionally it's impossible to mine Bitcoin on Mars. So <clears throat> as we kind of get into the mechanics of mining, because you got to receive the latest update of the blockchain, and you've got to then find a hash or create a block header with a hash above the difficulty of the previous uh, one. And then you have to add all the transactions and submit that to the blockchain. So the time delay between Earth and Mars means that like you would have to produce at minimum like a 10 to 1 ratio of mining or hash rate on Mars in order to participate in the Terran Bitcoin blockchain. Mm -hmm. And so this is where I say, I'm a Bitcoin maximalist so far as we are an earth constrained species mm. because a lot of people, uh, I think Bitcoiners might find this a bit heretical. I think that eventually the Martians, the Musk people, Elon Musk's <laughs> society he builds, 
<laughs> will have to begin their own proof of work blockchain. Hmm. And it may not be called Bitcoin. Maybe in it'd the be same way dollars. That, yeah, well, in the same way that um like why did the pilgrims uh leave England and go to uh North America? They um did it because <clears throat> to escape the region of influence and control over a previous state, which they did not agree with. Um, just by virtue of being distant means you are uh, difficult to control. I think that um, planets which are distant, which are outside of Bitcoin's kind of sphere of influence, 10 light minutes from, from Earth, that is where Bitcoin uh, mining can work. But outside of that, um, you uh, you really can't participate in the governance and consensus mechanism of Bitcoin. That also means you can create your own consensus or governance mechanism. If a proof-of-work blockchain is the optimal form of money, communication, and human or this organizational structure of a civilization, we would expect for there to be multiple planetary blockchains um, expanding across the solar system on, on habitable planets. One of, this, one of these science fiction conundrums is like, why would we even go explore space, the final frontier? Within our own solar system, there is effectively infinite carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, any elements we as humans could, could possibly want for the infinite future of humanity, thousands and thousands of years, we are not at, at, at uh, we do not have a dearth of resources domestically within our solar system. There is no monetary or financial incentive for us to ever go anywhere else. Why would we ever leave the planet or why would we ever leave a few planets in our solar system? Well, imagine we are like the pilgrims sometime in the future. And there are people who do not agree with the, the Bitcoin statists, if you will. And they want to go form their own planetary blockchain. Um, just by virtue of something or a planet or a region of space being distant means that they're not subject to the Bitcoin, you know, Earth, Terran, Bitcoin regime. And so this actually... Um, solves the kind of the the question of why would we ever actually go to space or beyond uh, the Earth? And it's because, um, simply because there are places that are far away. I don't believe the Star Trek, um, you know, um, prime directive thing to go and explore because there's really, I mean, that's novel, but that's that's good for, you know, Hollywood storytelling. It doesn't really provide a historical um, something that, that stacks up with, with history. We didn't send Magellan around the world to circumnavigate the earth because it was cool. It was to make money and expand the kingdom. Um, similarly, we didn't settle, uh, the, you know, European Western countries, not settle other continents uh, just because we wanted to. It's because it was economically advantageous. It was for ideological reasons. It was um, simply because... Uh, Society said we have to go there because it's far away. And I think as humanity looks to the stars, we will see that. And when we talk about type one, type two, Kardashev civilizations, um, I'm finally getting to that topic. <clears throat> um, uh, that is a way to measure the scale of a human civilization. Um, uh, and it is a way of measuring by uh, how much energy a civilization has leveraged towards the uh, uh how, how, it, how much energy that civilization has used or leveraged and it's divided into three tiers or beyond three tiers depending on who you are where um a type one civilization is where um they have leveraged a basically the entire conceivable energy production of a planet a type two civilization would be uh a, a civilization which has leveraged the entire energy production of a solar system or star and a type three would be something which has leveraged the entire energy production of a galaxy 
uh, pop pop science fiction analogies would be type one might be like a <laughs> might be like a Star Trek. So humanity uh, has colonized the entire world. We're going everywhere else, but we're not like we're not like crazy powerful. Type two might be like Warhammer 40k or like um, or Mass Effect the video game where you've now these civilizations are huge and they've managed to build like a Dyson sphere around the sun and to capture that energy. And then a type three might be like the galactic empire in star Wars, where they are a power that spans the entire universe or the galaxy basically. And um, this is a bit esoteric and weird. And I'm kind of like stumbling through explaining this, but this is where I think it gets very interesting to talk about. Um, well, that's uh, why you're a Bitcoin accelerationist. I mean, let's be honest. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're talking about civilizations where, and I agree with you, because if you listen to Sailor talk, he says money is the highest form of energy humans can achieve. And how we use our energy is really important, right? So being efficient is kind of all about how fast we're going to grow. So if you're a Bitcoin accelerationist, I'm just saying, like, I, it's, I mean, like, Bitcoin is great because... It's the most efficient way we can all use the most valuable energy we have on this planet, which is economic value, because that's what gets that's what gets shit done. And in order for us to get to Mars, and that's why I'm a little annoyed with Elon sometimes when it comes to like his takes on a lot of these things, because he doesn't, you know, and to me, it makes to me, it makes it a little faulty. Like, I don't know. I like I, I understand like he's trying to get us there. I actually have family that worked with Elon, started a school with him for his kids at SpaceX. And he said he was awesome, yada, yada, yada. But Bitcoin is the only way for us, at least on Earth, to get there, in my opinion. Yeah, there's not like really he... anything else that's going to get us there because it's either owned by somebody else. Uh, there's, you know, poor incentives, which is really is, that plays a big factor, right? And like turning our economic value into energy. I mean, and that's what it's kind of about is like how fast we can turn our economic value, energy, energy, you know. I don't know. It, it seems like Elon is kind of like going through the stages of discovering all the important things about Bitcoin. Like he's kind of where I was like eight years ago with like, well, yeah, we could just increase the block size and increase throughput. I'm like, well, yeah, why wouldn't we? Like Satoshi doesn't like say not to specifically. They kind of don't talk about it. I mean, don't we want everything to go through? But but then the block size wars happen. And I try to figure out what I think about that. And coming out of that, that's a multi-year process of of self-questioning and, and education and the conversation narrative advancing it's just i think he's just kind of going through a very public like learning curve yeah um well, people he's think he's some genius i think he's like no he he's been heads down building rockets for the past decade um he doesn't have all all day to spend on the internet reading and kind of driving the history yeah. On the United, yeah because honestly he's where you're at probably when it comes to the civilization aspect like he's all about accelerating us going forward, but yeah. Well, and that's why I want to like the money of it. He doesn't understand how that factors in. Maybe he, it's a different perspective because he already has. He's got money figured out for himself. I mean, like he's got enough. So <laughs> why would he think about money? Like he's like it's just not the first thing on his mind. Yeah, well, it's just because you you gotta in order to be able to to talk about Bitcoin, you have to be a monetary theorist. You have to be an expert on energy. You got to be an expert on macroeconomics. Right. These are not normal things. Most people just want to build cool shit or or have a family. That's what humans are built to do. We're not built to fundamentally question and try to reorganize a, a paradigm. And so, uh, you know, Elon, uh, he's very smart. Uh, but I, I think the messaging of, of kind of maybe like leapfrogging all of the growing pains that I and a lot of other people have had to go through of understanding how we think about Bitcoin if we can just leapfrog to like 15 steps down the road and be like, hey, there's this really cool shit we can do with Bitcoin and it's go colonize Mars. That's what you always want to do. That is like the the moon mission of the 60s. Like that is the carrot on the stick to get people excited about, about Bitcoin. I think this is a bit critical. I think we might have like full market dilution as far as like how many people are going to be onboarded to Bitcoin by talking about hard money. That's really cool. I just think like most people who are even open to that idea already think that. So like, how do you evangelize and communicate this? Mm. We've got to come up with like new ways to talk about it. And, mm. and, yeah. and 
and um because most people love their altcoins and they love their their shit coins um so i'm because like they're poor they're trying to make more money i mean exactly. most people out here don't have enough wealth or don't have enough money so they're looking for the quickest buck to make yeah and i think i mean i think more people need to get on board with what you're talking about and kind of like what i've said like we had riots in the streets over systematic quote-unquote oppression right and like i quite honestly personally don't agree with why those riots happen but it's also because i don't think people think about the money yeah it's like you guys just think about the money and they're like justifiably that's angry life. like yeah. why i i i don't i you're i don't like well. how you said that earlier towards yeah. like bitcoin makes you apolitical and isn't that kind of great like that's what everybody like be apolitical just be about the money be about helping other people be about learning and bitcoin hopefully elon finds this out too it kind of makes you that way do you feel like once you look at the world through bitcoin's perspective has it changed you over the past 10 years i mean obviously probably oh, yeah but you know what i'm saying like what's the biggest difference between you now and you 10 years ago when you're just getting into this so bitcoin especially bitcoin mining forces you to always be on the steepest learning curve imaginable and i think if i hadn't discovered bitcoin i would be um quite content and um probably stagnant in my thinking hmm. um as it is if you're gonna build a you know be in the bitcoin mining space or really just be in bitcoin whatsoever it forces you to every few years understand uh, more like it is this unending learning curve that you uh, you are it, it's not it's not a sisyphusian hill that you're pushing a rock up but rather it's this unending mountain where you crest a peak and then there's another peak and that mm. is what it is because you know when i started bit, you know getting into mining i i was like okay i got to figure out how to evaluate the asic market <laughs> and i've got to like i got to figure out like what hash rate is and but now I have to be an expert in like energy production. Um, I have to be able to talk coherently to an electrician. I now have to be an expert in contract negotiation because we're in oil and gas. I have to talk. I have to be extremely um, coherent about um, making novel analogies about the space to people in oil and gas. Mm. I now have to be a macro e economist. You know, 10 years ago, you could just kind of hand wave and say, oh, yeah, well, uh, you know the governments uh suck and bitcoin's this free world but now i gotta like have coherent sophisticated understandings of inflation like now i like have a schedule of like fed meetings which i gotta like freaking pay attention to now because it matters because i'm gonna get a question on the cpi print next week like it's that yeah. kind of thing and i have to be like and people ask me about like russia ukraine previously i could like have a hot take which isn't very nuanced but now i have to like contextualize it in the context of the global economic regime because i gotta i gotta justify bitcoin so i have mm. to be everything i can't I, you know you can't just like and this is that's this unending like hill where previously you could kind of toe the party line and you could say oh yes i'm this npc here is what i'm here's what i've been decreed to think um sure uh, Ukraine good, Russia bad, like that kind of thing. Now I'm like, like shit is much bigger than than we than we understand. I have to have a, um, I have to be able to talk any angle to any person about it because, uh, and it just it it requires you be very uh, have a lot of high neuroplasticity to yeah. always be engaging new information and not putting into this little box, but rather say. Um, I mean, I have all these puzzle pieces and I don't know how big the puzzle is. I'm going to put something together. And I'm going to have to pull these puzzle pieces apart and reconstruct them and then realize maybe the puzzle's not 2D, maybe it's 3D, you know, maybe it's 4D. I, I don't know. I, you just have to continually massage and develop these narratives. It's kind of like the internet was invented in the 70s or so. And then even in the early 90s, you've got those dumb, uh, you know, talking heads saying, what is internet? What is internet? Yeah. <laughs> and, and like and it only after the, you know, Netscape were normal people in their home computers at home, like moms being able to send emails, which honestly email is kind of weird until like the late 2000s. So we're still in the early 80s of this stuff. Like there do not exist mental models for most people, even Bitcoiners themselves. Mm. We don't have the mental models, which I think will be dominant mm. in 50 years.
kind of like the inventors of the internet could kind of say, yeah, we're going to have this higher frequency communication, but they couldn't concept what Facebook would be. They'd be like, I could see that, but they couldn't describe actually what that would be. That's uh, really goes into our last podcast. We were talking about, you know, Bitcoin is a little bit transforming the world and it's good to hear, you know, somebody obviously running a Bitcoin mining operation and uh, we haven't and like we haven't even dove in. I have a lot of questions about that, but the civilization stuff is interesting too. But as a Bitcoin miner, it seems to be more about what you know than who you know in this scenario. And as we, you know, get off what I mean, you could consider you're going up against the who you know world, which is funded by a petrodollar. Yeah. Oh, my family's in oil and gas and I'm taking that out, you know, so I'm the biggest criticism of the, the petrodollar regime. Yeah. I mean, and I actually just watched, uh, I don't know, Nick, if you already combed all the way through that, I just got really dove into that like a few weeks ago, honestly. And I don't know why it took me so long. Maybe it's because it's so well hidden. And if you're not like fluently on the internet or you don't have people like talking to you about it, you don't find the right person sometimes. People don't realize the internet truly is quite censored currently. And if you don't have somebody giving you the right information, you might not find it because this video I sent Nick, there was like 10,000 views. And I was like, this is the most well-explained version, like <laughs> what the petrodollar is, 30 minutes. I'm like, yeah, so America, what's going on? What's going on? And once you realize that, you know, as an, a citizen in the United States of America and like, and more so I'm more of a Bitcoin supporter than I am quite honestly, like at this point in a United States supporter, even though I live here because I Bitcoin is freedom. And once you realize the United States truly, I mean, like when you have this big of a military industrial complex, you can't be that free. Right. But, but if you support Bitcoin, you yourself are kind of like uprooting this uh, civilization we're living in, which, in my opinion, this is not where would you put where we're at right now, then? Because this is like, I mean, we have just a whole bunch of malinvestment, wasted money. I mean, houses are worth whatever you want them to be. Money's not working for people. You need insurance, you need Medicare just to make a health system function. I mean, that's not conducive to where we're trying to go at all. Like any of this really isn't. It's yeah. A while. I, we are on the very beginning of the uptick of the S curve of adoption. If under 3% of the world own Bitcoin or just even at you know, it didn't under 10% own any kind of crypto, but it's more like under 5% is probably more like what it is. Or at least I would, that's what it was a year ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, <clears throat> it's still just, you know, so it's early. still inning one of a, of a very long baseball game. And uh, yeah, you talk about the Metro dollar. I mean, look at what um, I like to talk about science fiction a lot. If you look at what Milton Friedman uh, once said, or Henry Ford, the you know yeah, American I'm entrepreneur, sure, yeah. they talk, they concept these things of like the energy dollar or an energy currency, and that is literally what Bitcoin is. This is like literally the science fiction imaginations that some of these very brilliant, forward-thinking uh, people had to imagine, and so um, yeah. If, if we talk about Bitcoin helps you preserve your monetary energy, but it really just it is energy itself. It is the most fundamentally scarce or or it is the fundamental unit of communication and transmission across the universe. This is like a very pure idea. This is where I get into really weird stuff like the well, then who was Satoshi? Because they had to not be just a sociologist or a economists but they had to be an astrophysicist too practically if you think about it so like a pretty big bitcoin figure had just posted a tweet i think a couple of days ago he was like it's a bit divine even because bitcoin does i mean like bitcoin it does teeter on religious at some some points because we're talking about uh, a guy who created this basically perfect computer network in terms of incentive structure because incentives for humans are so hard to figure out so to take humans out of money but still make it work like that's something that we've would anybody would love to do it if we could have done it because at the end of the day corruption nobody nobody can actually go out in the public and say oh yeah i like corruption like that uh, obviously not even though everybody does it um bitcoin is just the first opportunity we've had to take corruption out of money 
and all of these smart people, they'd love that because you fix the money, probably fix a lot of society's problems. But uh, yeah, I would say I would say fix the energy, uh, fix the energy, fix the world. Write that one down and hang it somewhere because it's true. And it is. I mean, money is time. Bitcoin is money. Bitcoin is energy. I don't know. Nick, you have any more questions? Um, I mean, of course, but to 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 not kick a dead horse uh, or to keep beating the dead horse. Yeah, um, man, it, 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 I think I love what your thought is on not having the language to really explain what Bitcoin is and and how many different things that it impacts. Right. I mean, Griff and I <clears throat> on this show specifically, we tend to focus a lot more on the uh, socioeconomical or economic uh, impacts and and what those implications are, what the current system is, what the path may be moving forward. Um, and uh, but but then it, it's it's so wild because, you know, we're in that niche, right? This one small niche of what Bitcoin is and can be into the future. And it's still so damn difficult to try to put the right words together to make this thing make sense. Right. To your point. How do we how, how do we as uh, the creators of the Internet, how do we explain Facebook in 20 years, 30 years? You know, like, I, how, you know, like you could kind of maybe kind of put a rough idea around it. But it's like, how, how can you even get there? Right. Um, and then and then you start to think about, oh, wait a minute. This isn't just an economics thing. This is about like the culture of people and how how we interact with each other. Right. Uh, because. You know, if we if we change money, then that will change the culture. And if the culture changes, what else changes? Right. What is included in the culture? Right. Uh, The way of life, how we communicate, um, religion, uh, politics and how we how we govern and control ourselves. Like what are the what is the standard, the way of life that we live by? So it's kind of interesting. I don't know if you've ever heard of Hillsdale College, but uh, they're based out of Michigan. Yeah, that newsletter. Yeah whatever it is. Anyways, they've got, they've got an awesome system where they've got online, free online courses. You go in, like set up an account and they've got these freaking awesome online courses. Um, and I'm right now in the middle of, uh, one of their courses. It's the rise and the fall of the Roman empire. Um, so first of all, before I get into what I was going to say, some interesting pieces from it. So the, uh, the empire itself was, uh, right around a thousand years, uh, in total, right from start to finish. Uh, but it also wasn't just the Roman Empire. So the empire, right, the Roman Empire was emperors, right? It was the emperor that ran everything. Uh, but previously before that, it was the Roman Republic. Um, and so it, it's kind of interesting, too, because the Roman Republic was in place from year one to uh, to 500 years in. And then it switched over to the Roman Empire about 500 years in and was the Roman Empire for the last 500 years. So it kind of splits right down the middle. An interesting fact is that 90% of what became the Roman empire was conquered and created in the, in the time of the Roman Republic, which was for the people by the people. And this was monetarily and economically before they started clipping coins and debasing the money, which is pretty interesting, right? Um, and so to, to think back on uh, on that, so they, they have a, a section in there. One of the lectures is all about the Roman Constitution. And uh, and it's it's funny because we, you know, like whenever you're translating this language to that language, sometimes there are words that don't have a one for one translation. Right. Typically, the way that we look at the word constitution is like, OK, what power does the government have? Right. What can they do? We, the people, give and, and grant the authority uh, for, for the federal government, a centralized government to do these things. And, uh, you know, this is where, uh, one piece where Griff and I differ, differ a little bit. Cause I mean, you go through and you, you read the constitution, it's three main branches of government, right? You've got the legislative branch, the, uh, the judicial branch and the executive branch and, and the checks and balances built into the constitution with those three branches. It's, it's incredible. I mean, th- it, I think it's very similar. Um, uh, there's obviously some, some discrepancies, but, very similar to to the idea that not one person or one node can change the protocol, right? There has to be there has to be a pretty large consensus that that everybody agrees upon to make some changes. But to, to go back to to what Bitcoin really does impact, so 
this this word, the Roman constitution, it was actually not a constitution in the way that we think about it. But that's the only word that we can use to kind of get close. So their Roman constitution was a, a it was a political structure, right? Similar to the way that we would view a constitution. But it also included things like education and uh, and living standards and religion. And it, it was it was more of like the culture with the political structure kind of tied into it. And uh, and they were huge on the idea that their constitution was what allowed them to scale in year 509, I think was the exact founding of Rome. That's what allowed them to scale and conquer the vast majority of the known world, right? That everybody says that, you know, the, the, the sun never sat on the Roman empire because it just, it, it, it encompassed so much geographical area. Um, but it's interesting that they, they say it was our constitution, right? That allowed them to do that, which was their way of life, right? It was their culture. And so it's, it's interesting to think about Bitcoin in this sense, where this isn't just economics. Yeah. It's, it's about culture. It's about how do we, what, whenever I wake up in the morning, how do I interact with my, my husband or my wife or my kids? How do I, how do I operate whenever I go to work? You know, because I think at, we as humans, I think it's built in that we, um, we have, we, we have some internal f- need to produce. Like whenever you're a part of something, whenever you're creating, I think that that brings, uh, I think that that brings fulfillment to people. Right. I, I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe some people are happy sitting on the couch and watching TV all day. But I think that uh, I think that people are ha- have some type of innate built in need to produce and create and, and achieve. Right. And to to move forward. And I think that Bitcoin really wraps its its uh, itself around uh, so many different pieces of this whole conversation. Griff, did you have something to say there? Well, yeah. So I'm listening to you talk and then I can remember something. Charlie said earlier, it was, you know, the Bitcoin white paper hanging right there could be the legislation that we started, right? That can last three to four centuries, I believe was the quote. Yeah. Um, You know, there's been the Roman Empire. There's been the American Empire, the British (laughs) Empire. There's been a lot of empires, whether, I mean, that's kind of how it goes. How do you see the, I guess, Bitcoin empire playing out? Will there be nation states? Is there a governing body? Do does this 90% vote with miners, you know, work in a sense to get us there fast? Is it going to take longer because of Bitcoin? Like what, how do you feel like it kind of fits in there? How do you feel like, you know, the governing body of this white paper for the next, like we said, if it lasts 500 years, that would be the longest standing, really the empire ever. I mean, I mean, at the end of the day. So how do you see it playing out? Gosh. <clears throat> well, um, So if we if we study human history and maybe the history of empires, um, you see the first real empire we can identify in human history is the Egyptian one, which spanned about 2000 years Mm -hmm. Then the Roman Empire and Chinese empires. But China wasn't as much of an empire as Rome was. Rome spanned what about a thousand years. Mm -hmm. The British Empire spanned about three or four hundred, five hundred years. Yeah. Um, then the American empire, I think may span 300, 250 years. The story of human history is a, is an acceleration of empire transition. Mm-hmm. These regimes get shorter and shorter. Mm-hmm. I think that's maybe coming to a point because I think, um, I don't want to say Bitcoin is an empire, but rather it's a new it, it, we've been we've been moving towards as a as a species um, towards something because we can't just say because eventually we can't say an empire only you know lasts two hundred then one hundred and fifty then eventually two years no we're accelerating towards some end state and um, I think Bitcoin is re- really a new foundation upon which to structure human society over the centuries coming forward. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know if we have, if we're federated underneath it or if we have some kind of states. I just think we don't even have the language to describe what even it looks like. Because think about it. We we talk about these governance regimes like uh, democracy, monarchy, um, you know, various types of states. But these only, these, these, 
these governance mechanisms existed when communication between humanity and, and consensus building was limited. When consensus building is, is effectively unlimited, then new ways of organizing humanity going forward become unlocked. And I don't know what those look like. Um, going back to the kind of mystical revelatory uh, conversation, I think Nick began with, I, I like to say kind of uh, affectionately, Bitcoin's, it's not a cult. It's not a cult. It's a religion. <laughs> and uh, it, that kind of does hold true. A lot of the religious language does map onto when uh, to really help think about what Bitcoin is. I The other title I give myself is Bitcoin evangelist. And much like an evangelist, often uh, it's not what you say, but it's rather the openness of the people you're speaking to and their openness to listen and hear. Um, uh, that... Uh, is something you don't have control over. You can say the right words, you can you can you can say something that is true, but it is really not up to you whether that message is received. Um, a prophet is never popular in their own time. Um, I believe that's Ecclesiastes, and um, I think that's similar to how we'll view uh, this. Uh, <clears throat> I think we'll I think we'll view uh, talking about Bitcoin today similar to that. Um, we can try to evangelize about it, but ultimately, it's you know, it's not our. We cannot force other people's ears to be open. We can only try to invite them, and to try to bring them in. And I don't know how that's done, but I'm searching for ways to communicate and evangelize about that. Eight point five. Right. That's what we're doing right here, right? Yeah, exactly. And and that's going. So now focusing more uh, small. That's why we can meet in person and talk about it. Right. Um, Cause I used to, you know, the, the whole Bitcoin story is like, it was kind of this thing online. I'd go into like Bitcoin talk and then r slash Bitcoin and then Bitcoin Twitter. And now really the most Bitcoin alpha that I find happens in person. The past 10 years, I've had like Bitcoin be this like weird, crazy idea that only I this only this world that only I lived in, which incubated in in this like weird crucible where I was kind of like isolated. Um, but you meet people in real life, and you have you know a few too many drinks with them, or and or you wake up hungover the next morning and trying to go to a conference. Like those real human interactions are uh, are I think more special because now Bitcoin is not this idea, but it's this. It's this, it's this protocol on which you both communicate and operate hmm. and have normal conversations, which are not about Bitcoin, but with other Bitcoiners. So now we can talk about, um, you know, if you're, you know, if you're going to uh, uh, like real, like real life shit, like, are you going to have another kid? Are you, are you happy? Um, you know, what did you just buy a new truck? How's that going? Like those are normal conversations which humans are supposed to have. We're not supposed to have like, is this idea of money supposed to be what we operate under? Like that's the world I want to get to where we can just be normal people where the idea of a Bitcoin meetup is not this thing where we share. Um, that's like having a meetup about like the dollar. We don't do that. That's just the way we we, we interact. Um, we can have meetups Un, you know, under uh, a Bitcoinized future where we can talk about um, normal things, uh, which humans are supposed to talk about, not not about generational paradigm shifts. Mm. That's interesting. I like that. Yeah, I want to get to a way a future where having a Bitcoin meetup is kind of redundant. It's beautiful. Hey, Charlie, this has been an absolute. I, I don't have the <laughs> language to describe it. I mean. It's it's been really cool, man. Uh, you're you're definitely gonna have to be somebody that that comes on multiple times. It, this is, I mean, we're we're sitting here at, at an hour and twenty four minutes. I mean, we're probably gonna have to cut this into like Charlie Spears part one, part two. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, this is, uh, dude. Some of the some of the content here is is stuff that Griff and I have kind of kind of thought about a little bit, but man, I mean, you really take this, these thoughts to another level, which uh, allows us to then, oh man, because I, because I go back and, you know, whenever we get these uh, uploaded, I'll listen to it. 
And yeah. dude, I'm gonna have to listen to this like five or six times. And thank God Griff's taking notes on on what you said and where it's at because I mean we we have hit on a lot of really interesting and super complex topics that could you know this 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 episode that we just filmed is something that we could go back and say hey let's listen to this little five minute clip and then let's break this out into a full episode I mean we can do yeah. that probably uh, unlimited amount of times um from from just this content so dude it has been an absolute pleasure to have you on thank you so much for joining us i'm excited to to get to meet uh, um a couple of the people in the tulsa bitcoin oh, meetup you'll group. be amazed how many of the of us there are in tulsa and my goal is to to bring people like you and the and my other co-organizers into to to you know we we get about 40 people i want this to be a 200 person meetup by the end of the year it what an, one you know last thing I'll reflect on is um, I, I love talking about it, but I actually don't think I'm much smarter than other people. I actually think I've just been around the block a few more times. I What I want to do is give other more insightful, smarter people than me the tools and just accelerate them past all the difficult like steps to, to get to at least thinking about the next thing. And I think once other people, uh, if I can help bring everyone else up to speed, then other people can surpass me uh, and and really, really do some some cool stuff building in and around and amongst Bitcoin. So I think hey, you Charlie, guys are where, where on can, that track. Yeah. Where can people get a hold of you? If, if you know, I know you're we, we got connected on Twitter. Um, what where where is the best place for people to get connected with you if they want to get connected? For sure. I uh, the easiest place is my Twitter at C B Spears on Twitter. Um, if you want to uh, uh, get plugged into my company, Naka Motor, that's nakamotor.io, N A K A M O T O R.io. There's a newsletter actually that my um, that we've uh, that we will resurrect, and that's a newsletter that's targeted specifically to oil and gas folks to talk about Bitcoin and new ideas. Um, so yeah, nakamoto.io um, newsletter. And then if you want to, uh, uh, CB Spears. And then the, the Bitcoin meetups, there's a Facebook group, Tulsa Bitcoin meetup. And then there's a meetup.com group, uh, Tulsa Bitcoin meetup. Those are, the, those are the places to get plugged in. Beautiful. Charlie, we absolutely appreciate you hopping on here. Um, we're looking forward to the next one. For sure, guys. All right, Charlie, you have a great rest of the day, brother. Rock. Griff, how about this guy, huh? Yeah, for real. I mean, uh, you, your brain's probably fried. I know mine is, so <laughs> I don't know if you have much thoughts here, but uh, we're going to have to go over some of those notes that you took and uh, think about some of those things. Dude, I mean, wow, huh? Yeah, it was good. Good guest. Um, great guest. Uh, and honestly, answering so many questions, I hope we can get them back on to maybe even just go over maybe some of the basics of Bitcoin mining for other people, because a lot of mm -hmm. our listeners, uh, however, they may be a little bit scarce at the moment. It seems like a lot of them are just getting into it, really. So him to come back on and maybe go over just Bitcoin mining uh, a little bit on more of like a basic level for some people um, would be really cool. But yeah, that was Thank you for Nick did a really good job uh, meeting Charlie. So shout out to Nick to get him on the show and hopefully we can keep him on as a recurring guest. He was pretty, uh, that was pretty Absolutely. awesome. Well, Hey guys, we appreciate you listening to another episode. Go check us out uh, on Twitter right down there at Nick and Griff show. Um, we are always wanting to bring more guests on, have more conversations, uh, listen to new perspectives, learn from new perspectives so that we can, broaden our own perspective so that we have more of a full rounded view so we appreciate you guys listening to another episode and we will see you next time peace